Hello, my name is Edward. I'm an artist and activist based out of Louisville. Uh, this past Monday, as a nation, we celebrated Columbus Day. He's considered a figure so important we'll close our national institutions in his honor, just like George Washington or Dr. Martin Luther King. However, his place in history is somewhat infamous. Some call him a patriot, others a crook, a maverick or a hoax, pioneer or a murderer, but in the end, he represents the beginning of a new era. With his discovery and the work of untold tens of thousands of people over hundreds of years, we've permanently changed the face of the planet forever. Now, I'm not saying this is entirely a bad thing. Without his discovery and the subsequent conquest of the American Indian peoples, not a single one of us would be here today. Hard to imagine what the world would be like without it, really. I mean, as we grow up, we have little context of what our country was like before European, or European settlers arrived on the, on the eastern shore. In fact, some of the only reminders we have are in the names of cities like Muskegon, derived from the Ottawa Indian term for marshy river or swamp, or Chicago as their interpretation of the Miami, Illinois word Chicago or smelly onion. We go about our lives blithely unaware of the grandeur that was once the great American continent. With Spanish, when Spanish explorers first surveyed the South, they had said that maths of unimaginable length can be hewn from the trees they had found. English settlers went so far as to compare our country to the Garden of Eden itself. It's sad to stand here today and say to you that none of these forests remain. In fact, they were already decimated in the early 1900s just before the Dust Bowl, the last vestiges of which in the South and the Midwest have faded away due to climate change or suburban sprawl, otherwise known as progress. Yes, we have some old growth forests left. There's a pocket in New York State, a few small preserves peppered about the Midwest and the South, and a decent amount of acreage here in Michigan, but the rest, practically the entire area from the Mississippi all the way to the eastern shore, is gone. The best, the best example we have left are the Sierra Redwoods on the western coast, but that's really only because the wood is generally useless and splinters easily. When we do cut one down, it's made into things like toothpicks. The rest of our nation, essentially anything east of the Rockies leading to the Mississippi, was once prairie. French for meadow, but, now, but known by the American settlers as an ocean of grass. We've heard of the stories of endless herds of buffalo and antelope that thundered through the Great Plains, but have we heard much else, like how pioneers would travel for miles in grasses 10 feet tall with no sense of what they would encounter with each step, or deer jumping out of seemingly nowhere amidst the blades of grass, or huge swarms of thousands of bees descending on a bush of brilliant red flowers and jutting into the sky? These fields had roots that reached 8, 10 feet deep with organic matter that would die back every year. After millennia, it created some of the richest soils in the world and therefore was conquered and compounded by the plow to sow acre upon thousands of acre of corn. Less than 1% of what was once covering a third of our nation is left. Even smaller of a percent is the true virgin prairie. Now, I don't mean to come here and depress you with stories about what once was. There are lots of beneficial things that have come from the conquest of this land, the least of which is this country itself. You and I, right here. I'm not trying to say, shame on you, or shouldn't you feel terrible, but rather trying to inspire in you the awe that moved our forefathers to the sublime. Wouldn't it be great if we could turn back the clock and set up the national parks before there was a nation? But as it turns out, that's impossible. And in the end of the day, we're left with cornfields and highways and suburbia, that makes up the fabric of our modern society. The struggle then is not wasting time over what we could have or should have or would have done, but what we can do right now or tomorrow or in the next week. You've got a lot of lectures to see today, so if there's one thing you're going to take away from my speech, it's this, it's stop mowing your front lawn, or at least a small portion of it. The only way to develop an old growth forest or prairie is to stop cutting it down everything when it's just a sprout. If every citizen in Muskegon stopped mowing 10 square feet of their property, that's just five by two feet, there would be a genuine preserve of more or less 10 acres within the city limits. If every citizen of Michigan stopped mowing a space equivalent to about 10 by 12 feet on their property, they would increase the amount of wilderness by about 45,000 acres. That's 70 square miles or almost four Muskegons put together of pure unadulterated land that was left alone by humans and allowed to grow wild once again. Obviously, an unmowed portion of property is not the same as a state park, but it's certainly a start. I would love in my lifetime to see the front lawns that dominate our landscape, a relic of the past. 
In my personal opinion, they're hideous because they endanger the environment. The idea of an eco-friendly manicured lawn is an oxymoron. Generally, lawns are monocultures that take more pesticides and herbicides per square foot than modern agribusiness. The EPA estimates that 70 million pounds of pesticides are used yearly in the United States for lawn, to keep lawns looking green. It's also estimated that 17 million gallons of gasoline are spilled every year refilling small motorized lawn equipment. That's practically two Exxon Valdez spills every summer. Not only that, but when the grass is cut, it limits the depth of the, which the roots can grow. That means the soil becomes compacted over time, and the water will run off the surface and in, in, into the sewers and rivers. This carries with it the soil and nutrients that are hard to replace, straight into the ocean. Furthermore, when the grass is cut, it cannot grow tall and become cover for wildlife or produce seed that feeds things from grasshoppers and birds alike. I'll forgive you if you want some green lawn, however. Maybe you're trying to keep up with the Joneses or have a sterile environment for your kids drone at, run, out, run around in, but at the very least, you should let some embankment or corner a hill or otherwise hard to mow, mow space grow wild. Go to your local nursery and pick up some packets of region-specific native wildflowers and spread them around. Since they're, native to the, and use, since they're native, they're used to this climate and require no extra work or maintenance to grow and give you a full summer of blooms. They are also magnets for bumblebees and butterflies, which, if you have children, can be used as a great teaching tool. Try playing some coneflowers or switchgrass around your house if you're having water problems. The deep root structure of native flora will wick the rain down the water table and away from, away from your basement. It also keeps the runoff from filling the sewers and allows it to drain more naturally back in the ecosystem. Take some time to plant a tree or two while you're at it, perhaps even the state tree. It's bad enough that, you can't, that you, when you drive from Seattle to Fort Lauderdale, all you see are the same restaurants, convenience stores mile after mile. So why do we have to see the same plants too? Take a minute and learn what grows locally and try to give your garden the landmarks that make it uniquely Great Lakes or Coastal South or Pacific Northwest or whatever. You can take it a step further and make some seed bombs to throw into abandoned lots near where you live. I've been doing it for years, and believe me, there's nothing better than seeing the otherwise eyesore of your neighborhood in your neighborhood become a meadow within a season. Most of the flowers and grasses have become extinct locally in major cities, so it's important to reintroduce them back into the environment. In the end, there's plenty to be done to curb suburban sprawl and deforestation on a national scale, but in the meantime, let's start at your own house. Nothing is going to grow in pavement, so put it in your lawn instead. Hell, put it in your neighbor's lawn when they're asleep. Let's try and work collectively on our own time to restore the beautiful mosaic that was once the virgin wilderness like no other. The worst that can happen is you'll feed some bees and increase your curb appeal. This continent has given us so much that we take for granted. If I were bolder, I would say that every one of you has eaten corn or coffee Vanilla, chocolate, tomatoes, potatoes, squash, pumpkins, peppers, blueberries, raspberries, agave, maple syrup, turkey, bison, peanuts, or pecans in the past week. Some of you may have had a cigarette before you came in here or a shot of tequila last Friday. These are all plants that are native to the Americas and representative of her bounty. So the least you can do is give a little bit back instead of taking it all away. The short answer on how to be green is to stop putting so much effort into lawn care. Let Mother Nature just sort of take her course. Discover how easy it is to help the environment through an ecological virtue called neglect. Thank you.